3 a.m. It will be found an unjust and unwise jealousy to deprive a man of his natural liberty upon the supposition he may abuse it. George Washington. They who would give up an essential liberty for temporary security deserve neither liberty or security. Benjamin Franklin. The Constitution is not an instrument for the government to restrain the people. It is an instrument for the people to restrain the government, lest it come to dominate our lives and interests. Patrick Henry. America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it would be because we destroyed ourselves, Abraham Lincoln. I predict future happiness for Americans if they can prevent the government from wasting the labors of the people under the pretense of taking care of them. Thomas Jefferson. Property is surely a right of mankind as real as liberty. John Adams. The Constitution is a guide which I never will abandon. George Washington. This morning, welcome to Hour 1 of Patriots Lament. We like to call it the Saturday morning wake-up call. Coming to you live from Fairbanks, Alaska, here at KFAR at 660 on your AM dial. But we are also coming to you on the radio, on your website. If you've got KFAR660.com on your browser, you can also find us in your smartphone. If you've got a smartphone, you can download the free app. Tune in radio and find us there at KFAR. Joining us as always in the studio from Bighorn Enterprises, Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. And his brother Aaron. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Steve. Hang on, Aaron. I don't have you on my microphone. Let's try that again. Good morning, Steve. There you go. I found your mic. Sure. All right. And joining us on the telephone from the Mises Institute, Mark Thornton. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Steve. It's great to be on the program. It's good to have you here. Josh, would you like to introduce? Yes, this is uh, Dr. Mark Thornton. He's, uh, I'm just going to read off the Wikipedia page here real quick. American economist at the Austrian School has written on the topic of prohibition of drugs, the economics of the American Civil War, and the Skyscraper Index, which is pretty fascinating. You should, and people listening should, if we don't get into this today, should look that up. Well, the first time I heard that, I think, was when you were with... Uh, Tom Woods on his Tom Woods radio show talking about that skyscraper index. That's very interesting. It's funny how you could document that. But anyways, here he is, uh, Mark Thornton. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Josh. It's great to be on the program. And uh, the skyscraper index is is a fascinating thing. If we don't get into it, you can go to M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G and search for skyscraper and Thornton. And you'll find all the pictures and graphs and, uh, you know, what that theory is all about. Yeah, it's fantastic. I I was blown away the first time I was introduced to that. It's pretty interesting. We do encourage all our listeners every Saturday to pop into the Mises Institute and LouRockwell.com daily. Wealth of knowledge there. Um, Mark, could, if you could just start by, for the people that don't know, introducing yourself to us, how you maybe came to the Austrian school, um, libertarianism, and the final anarcho-capitalism in your life. Well, I grew up in the 1970s, late 1970s, and uh, went to college in late 70s, early 80s, and that was a very, very bad economic times uh, in the United States. You remember 10% unemployment, uh, over 10% inflation, no jobs to speak of anywhere, the stock market down. It was really a bad time, and I came across references to Austrian ec- economics and tried to find out more about it, but, you know, that was before the Internet, and uh, it was very, very hard. Uh, I did get a little bit of it in college uh, on my own, and I uh, decided to go to graduate school, 
And Auburn University was one of the few places that was tolerant of Austrian economics. They didn't teach much of it, but they were at least tolerant of it. And so I came down here from western New York to Auburn, Alabama, and, uh, you know, tried to continue my studies in Austrian economics. It was difficult, but the next year, Lou Rockwell founded the Mises Institute Hmm. uh, and established it at Auburn University and, you know, started, you know, doing newsletters and books and conferences um, you know, so I was very, very lucky to have had the opportunity, um, you know, in the coincidence of Lou Rockwell coming to Auburn, Alabama, right after I had. And I've been with the Mises Institute in one form or another uh, for the, over the last 30 years. And, of course, we've gotten much, much uh, bigger and influential. Just this last week, the New York Times and the Washington Post attacked and Austrian economics. So I think things are looking up uh, in the world, and, you know, we have the world's largest economic webpage in Mises Org. Wow. Yeah, I, I've uh, been following that with the New York Times. They're trying to, that little hit job they did with you guys and trying to make Rand Paul out to be this evil person connected to these evil men, and especially uh, <laughs> Loyola University hammering on Dr. Walter Bloch. It's been pretty interesting. It, obviously, you guys are getting the job done. <laughs> well, you know, um, when you're the, the David in the equation and you're going up against Goliath, which is big government, um, you know, first they try to ignore you, and that's what they did to us for a very long time. They just ignored us. And then in recent years, they've been making fun of us and fun of Austrian economics and traditional free market economics. Uh, you know, they've been calling the Austrian theory of the business cycle the hangover theory and, uh, you know, and, and making fun of us uh, in our predictions about what Bernanke's policies will end up doing uh, to Americans in their, uh, in their money, in their bank accounts. And now they're attacking us. So this is this is actually what we view as a good sign, the fact that the New York Times and the Washington Post on two occasions, and actually both publications on more than one occasion in recent times have attacked us. And so we view that as a sign of our success, that we're doing the right things, that we're, uh, you know, accurately radical in our approach to things. Um, and that more and more people are coming to believe us, and they're coming to us for their information. They're coming to, you know, programs like yours in the alternative media space for their information, you know, for a difference of opinion. You know, it's like a medical situation. The doctor continues to get it wrong. Well, you should seek a second opinion, and that's what Americans are doing is they're looking for a second opinion, and they're finding that, hey, the Austrian school – makes sense it makes common sense it's in it's in line with reality that you know working saving investing is the way to prosperity and the idea that printing up money and the government spending it willy-nilly borrowing money is is the way to uh, is the way to prosperity well that's obviously false and so we're winning i think josh absolutely when you uh i guess you'd have to they would have to come after you guys eventually because you guys have the truth on your side. And when you have people like Ron Paul and Peter Schiff that were forefront in the news all the time calling the housing bubble before it happened, years before it happened. I mean, I remember when Peter Schiff was on different um, talk shows on the news, like Fox News or whatever, saying, it's going down here within the year or whatever. And they'd mock him, make fun of him and everything. You guys are right every time. And sometimes it's not necessarily, you know, you can't put a timeline on it necessarily. It's just like I always wonder, when's the collapse coming? But the truth is, you guys are right. You know it's going to happen. Yeah, and and Ron and Peter, I'm sure they got that on their own, but I uh, wrote something about the housing bubble. Yes, you did. In February of uh, 2004 on lewrockwell.com, and then again in June of 2004 on mises.org. Um, you know, so we were out far in advance and, uh, you know, and that's our purpose at the Institute is to be able to 
sit back, look around, and, and see what these guys are really up to. And, uh, you know, they were causing a housing bubble, and we called that housing bubble what caused it, what the consequences would be, what their response would be, and why it was wrong. And that's all played out. Yep. You know, and so, uh, you know, my article is called Housing, colon, Too Good to be True, question mark. And, you know, basically I laid it all out there for people, and I had people calling me, you know, asking, should I buy a house or should I sell my house? And I was like, well, I'm not an investment advisor. <laughs> um, I'm just telling you what's going to happen in my view of things. And, uh, you know, and central banks are still blowing up housing bubbles around the world. Uh, there's one right between you and me in Canada. Yep. Canada's got a housing bubble, and it's continuing to go up because of fresh Chinese money coming in. Uh, they're, you know, people are fleeing with their money from China and Canada and Vancouver in particular is one of the places they're, you know, holding out in. Where do you see the, uh, I mean, I don't believe, I don't know too many people do believe that we're in this recovery here in the States. I would think that uh, obviously it's just from quantitative easing, pumping money into different areas, making things look good. And now they're starting to uh, pull back some of that QE. Where do you see that? <laughs> Where do you see us going? I know I'm jumping. I'm probably jumping to the finish line there. But we've got <laughs> lots of things I'd like to talk to you about. But since we're talking about economics and the economy, where do you see these things happening where we're at right now? Well, you know, uh, printing money and, and government borrowing is never a good idea, and it never ends. Uh, you know, it always ends badly. and And so... It, it's hard to say precisely what's going to happen because we don't know precisely when and uh, in what direction the central bank is going to go and and Obama and the Congress is going to go. Uh, but Janet Yellen is an inflationist, just like Ben Bernanke was. In some senses, she's worse. In, in others, maybe she's a little better. But uh, generally speaking, it's the old Harvard-MIT mindset where they think that they can you know, engineer the economy like an engineer would uh, manipulate a, a, a combustion engine um, or a forklift, um, and so that's their mindset. And they don't they don't believe that they're the cause of the problem. So they are basically clueless. the The minutes from the Fed meetings from 2008 are just just came out. Were just released after six years, and they indicate that they had no idea what was coming that they had no idea of the magnitude of what they had caused and that they were um, very unclear as to how to proceed um, at the time. So going forward, uh, you know, we're in a world currency war. It's not just the United States that's doing this, but other countries around the world, uh, Japan and uh, Europe, the European Central Bank, all of these, which, of course, are, are run by MIT, Harvard-type economists, um, they're all pumping money into the economy. They're all pumping liquidity uh, into the economy. They're all engaged in quantitative easing or buying up assets out of the economy. Um, so this could head in several directions, um, but they're all ultimately going to, be a lot of pain for average citizens, uh, you know, depreciation of the currency or price inflation, uh, even hyperinflation is a distinct possibility where the purchasing power of the dollar falls precipitously or significantly in the short run rather than the traditional inflation that we've gotten, which is slow over the longer run. Um, and then there's, of course, all of these bubbles, housing bubbles in Canada, uh, Norway, Sweden, uh, Switzerland, uh, Australia. You know, there's, there's several housing bubbles going on around the world. Those could collapse. Uh, stock markets, which have been pumped up beyond belief, in my opinion, uh, and even the bond market has been pumped up um, and uh, and so those bubbles can also collapse. 
Um, you'd see the stock market probably collapsing before the bond market here in the U.S., but they're all very vulnerable. They've all been blown up artificially by the Federal Reserve, and it's just a matter of time and how significant the collapse will be once they do collapse. So, you know, there's uh, the very good likelihood that there's going to be uh, significant deflation in asset prices in asset markets. And so, you know, those are those are things, you know, basically um, most people here in the United States um, and in the non-United States um, have not benefited from what Bernanke and the Fed have been doing. Um, and, uh, you know, but they could be, they also could be hurt um, when these markets collapse or when the dollar uh, depreciates, um, you know. And in some sense, for our entire lifetimes, the U.S. dollar has been the dominant currency in the world. And it continues to be that, but it's losing, it's losing that dominance. And if we were to completely lose that dominance in the coming crashes, uh, that would be a significant harm uh, to the average American who is going to see, you know, the value of their money and their bank accounts and their bonds and their life insurance policies, um, you know, evaporate to a significant degree. It would be cat- catastrophic, wouldn't it? It could be catastrophic. Uh, we we always hope for the best. We always hope <laughs> we always hope that markets will be allowed to take care of these problems. That entrepreneurs and markets will be given um, full sway and being able to address the problems of these collapsing market in bankruptcy courts as well. Um, but the catastrophic part comes into play if the government does the wrong thing right at at the wrong time and you know we can go back and look at the great depression and what we saw in the late 1920s as the stock market was booming the government was also buying up uh surplus wheat and it continued to buy up surplus wheat as we went into the stock market crash trying to keep wheat prices and wheat farmers in business and when it found out that it couldn't do that, instead of just stopping, they started selling. And when they started selling, the price of wheat collapsed, and farmers went under and uh, you know, made things so much worse for such a significant sector of the American economy. So what we have to hope for is that the government will stay out of the way and not try to solve the problem, we've seen what the government when the government tries to solve the problem uh, in this last crisis, where they went, you know, ape on uh, the economy. You know, in terms of automobile industry, the financial markets, housing markets, mortgage markets, they took over the mortgage market. So, you know, and they they didn't solve the problem. They only increased the national debt by seven trillion dollars. Do they so, re- do they believe? I mean, I get, I wonder this myself personally all the time. Do these people, the Bernanke's, Yellen's, these, uh, these Keynesians, do they actually believe in what they're doing, or do they have an ulterior motive to what they're doing? Like theft? Like theft, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, guys, I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's mostly they believe in what they do. Um, you know, they went to the most notable colleges and university and the most notable um, graduate programs and they they all studied. went to Mises? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and they you know they studied under Nobel Prize winning economists yeah. and they got, you know, prestigious positions at universities and and nonprofit organizations and they were hired by the government to be, you know, Fed Bank chairman, uh, president of the Fed, uh, Yellen was president of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, um, you know, vice chairman, council of economic advisors. So they were given all of this positive reinforcement, and they thought their theories were working. And, you know, even a bad economic theory can 
seem okay. Like a broken clock. Yeah, like it's a broken clock. Twice. I mean, you know, <laughs> if, if, if you're dealing with the world's most successful, largest economy, even a crackpot Keynesian uh, might not be able to do enough damage to show. <laughs> and so that's basically what's been going on. And now they're sitting there, and they don't have any alternative theory, and they're bamboozled in, as to what to do. And, you know, it's like the old joke, how many economists does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is none. When the light bulb goes out that they got in graduate school burns out, they just sit there mm. in the dark. And that, my friends, is what we are right now. Is <laughs> yep. They're sitting there. They've used all of their ammunition. And, uh, you know, they've, what they've done is they've created bubbles, but they haven't created economic recoveries. And so they're just sitting there uh, playing a confidence game that they can convince everybody that they're on the right path, that things are better, They'll manipulate the statistics when and wherever necessary, and um, and that's where we stand. You know they've they've been brought up in this position, and you, you guys know that Bernanke wrote his doctoral dissertation on the Great Depression, and what he came to the conclusion of, and similar it's similar to Milton Friedman's, but it's different, and it's different because what he came to the conclusion was. We had a Great Depression because the central bank, the Fed, failed to bail out the big New York City banks. So if you were in the market for a Fed chairman <laughs> and you were at a New York big city bank, Ben Bernanke was the guy who literally wrote the book mm -hmm. on bailing out the big New York City banks when they get in trouble. Mark, this is Steve. I have a couple wow. quick questions for you here based on a couple of things that you've said. One is, as you're talking about all these experts patting each other on the back about their own viewpoints, it reminds me of the old story about the emperor's new clothes. You've got a bunch of ignorant people telling each other how smart they are, and everybody else just looking at them saying, you guys are morons. And yet they, they, they hold the, the purse strings to the entire country. And, and that's the, where the second, and, and I, I wonder what your point of view is on that. Is, is this something like the Emperor's New Clothes where we can wake people up by just simply yelling, hey, he's naked? Or <laughs> is it, are, are we too far gone down the, the uh, public indoctrination where most people just kind of stumble through life and accept whatever they're told? The second question that I have is what does this mean for Joe Sixpack? You're talking about hyperinflation in terms of what does it mean for the guy who's got, you know, a couple of thousand dollars in a savings account for a rainy day uh, who maybe had is carrying ten thousand or more on a credit card or you know, is, is semi in debt uh, who makes you know twenty twenty five dollars an hour whatever what does it mean for Joe sixpack well I think you know my personal point of view is that we have to yell that the emperor has no clothes at every opportunity that's why I'm on the air with you guys here today and, um, you know, I think that that's what we've been doing at the Institute since 1982, um, starting with virtually nothing. And, uh, you know, Lou Rockwell got into the business of promoting freedom and the gold standard. And so did Ron Paul in 1971 when Nixon took us off the gold standard. And we've been trying to bring this issue to the attention of the American people and believe me, it was an incredibly difficult, <laughs> thankless uh, task for many, many years. But now there's more and more people like us. There's more and more alternative news sources like yours that are yelling the emperor has no clothes. And, you know, and that leads me into my, to the second question is what to do. Well, you know, I, I would say that for, fortunately for you all, and to a, set, to a lesser degree me, uh, we live in parts of the country that are mostly self-reliant um, in on many things, and um, and we're far away from the hubs of financial markets, which will uh, receive the brunt 
of the blow uh, to come. And, and so there's that solace that we can take. Um, you know, I think that it is wise for everybody to be more self-reliant today than you were yesterday. Uh, and a, a, some part of that has to do with um, diversifying yourself economically in the sense of buying an insurance policy of gold and silver, uh, something that will, in an inflationary environment, uh, you know, if inflation becomes important, if risk and uncertainty become important, gold and silver tend to act as a buffer to that sort of thing. And, you know, I had a friend, and this was before the economic crisis, and it was actually a little bit before uh, the housing bubble really got going, and he was in uh, difficult times um, for himself personally uh, because he was somebody who worked in landscaping and uh, home repair and that sort of stuff, and he was physically injured for a significant period of time and really couldn't work. And uh, what got him through that was his uh, great uncle had given him silver coins uh, as birthday and Christmas gifts throughout his entire childhood and into a, um, until the young, uh, uncle died. And he was able to use those uh, silver coins to get through some tougher times and to uh, be able to purchase Christmas gifts uh, for his kids. And, he, uh, you know, so that was it. So it's like an insurance policy. Once you buy those gold and silver coins, you don't tend to sell them. <laughs> Or use them until an emergency is there. So that's that's one thing that people can do specifically um, within the general um, uh, recommendation to become as self-reliant as you can be. Mark, we're coming at the bottom of the hour break. We got a minute, and then we'll be right back to you. Can you hang with us? Yes, I can. Right on. Thank you. And you've got it on Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. It's local talk radio online at KFAR660.com. After the Fox News, we've got more with Mark Thornton. Fox, now on KFAR. Fox News Radio, I'm Pat O'Neill. The Ukrainian parliament has voted to dismiss as president and to hold new elections in May. When President Yanukovych fled his home in Kiev, rumors began to fly that he'd left the country. Yanukovych turned up later today, though, on video, however, apparently in eastern Ukraine, calling the events a coup, the protesters' bandits, and even comparing the situation now to the rise of the Nazis in Germany. Fox's Amy Kellogg in Kiev. Another disappointment on ice for Team USA as the men's hockey team fails to get an Olympic bronze medal, losing to Finland 5 to nothing. Finns scoring two quick goals early in the second period, and the U.S. shut out. A bad day as well for American skier Ted Ligeti, a gold medal winner earlier in the week. He failed to finish in the slalom. Fox News Radio's Simon Owen in Sochi, Russia. The U.S. now trails Russia in the total medal count, 29 to 27. Fox News, we report, you decide. When news happens, we're there. To bring you the facts, first hear about it, then talk about it on Local Talk Radio, 660 AM. Oh, incidentally, I'm Alan Adeo, a minstrel. Oh, that's an early day folk singer. And my job is to tell it like it is, or was, or whatever. Robin Hood and Little John walking through the forest Laughing back and forth at what the other has to say Reminiscing this and that and having such a good time Oodle lolly, oodle lolly, golly, what a day And welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR Technically this is our one, it used to be considered its own program to a certain degree but it just all bleeds together at some point. And uh, I guess, you know what, that's kind of the philosophy here, is that if we don't bleed together, we'll bleed separately, right? <laughs> <laughs> Joining us We're as always bleed. <laughs> in the studio, we've got uh, Josh and Aaron Bennett. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. And on the phone with us this morning from the Mises Institute, Mark Thornton. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Steve. All right, good to have you all here. Josh, direct us back into the conversation. I want to do, do a little bit of a turn. Your turn. 
uh, along kind of the same things. But, um, Mark, I wanted to talk to you about a great economist, Mr. Frederick Bastiat. Um, the last several weeks here, we've been talking, been focusing on uh, his book, The Law, and we've been focusing on actual law versus political law and and you know man-made garbage is whatever you pull out of your hat and force on the people that being illegitimate versus legitimate law like we know you know the non-aggression principle basically and i was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about that i mean that has we are against the drug war or whatever not that we recommend people use such things because they can be harmful to your body, but so can being thrown in prison <laughs> and being torn from your family for doing things like that. But do we see the the, law, the war on drugs, illegitimate law, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And, um, you know, Frederick Bastiat drew that distinction so very clear in the, his pamphlet, The Law, uh, he was a French economist and legislature in the mid-19th century who went on a writing campaign to show the people what the true free society was and what was the illegitimate side, which is mostly government, where some people plunder other people. And so the, the pamphlet, The Law, is his most important work. I um, put together the Bastiat Collection, which is an entire collection of his English translations. And I'm coming out this spring with a Bastiat Reader, which is going to be kind of like a greatest hits album of all of his greatest works. And it's going to include the law. And uh, what Bastiat did there was he showed that there's a type of law that is common to all people uh, that developed as humans became social beings um, and had to interact on with one another on a regular, ongoing basis. And so the law, as far as Bastiat is concerned, uh, is basically individuals have natural rights to protect their person and their property and their liberty. And this fundamental basis um, then b builds a system of law that uh, tells us we can't steal, we can't take from others, we can't hurt others unless they first aggress against us. And so these are all the basic laws of humanity, that sort of the Ten Commandments of the human species um, that is... Uh, common to all people, basically. And so this is the natural law based on man's um, distinctiveness and what it takes to allow human beings to act socially with one another, and that basically means living with one another, trading with one another, working with one another. What does it take to make that system work? to prevent people from stealing and defrauding others, from harming each other, killing each other. And so that's the law. And then Bastiat distinguishes that type of law from basically legislation or man-made law in the sense of a legislature or a dictator writing down directives that certain people must do certain things, including paying taxes, and so forth, um, that is not uh, legitimate law. It's merely legislation of a subset of society that imposes it, it tries to impose its will on the remainder of society. So you have the, the tax, uh, the, the people who tax others and the people who are taxed and regulated. Um, and so that distinction, I think, opened up a lot of people's eyes, and it still does today. That's the, that's the funny thing, is it's still uh, making itself felt today that, you know, you sit down and read the law, and then you all, all of a sudden you realize, oh, yeah, that's right. I mean, there's a distinction between 
what the government does in terms of preventing robbery and theft and battery and assault and fraud uh, and counterfeiting and things of that nature. And in distinguishing that between uh, uh, from things like raising the minimum wage and Obamacare <laughs> and you know things of that nature, those are two different animals. Those are two different ball games, and one of them is legitimate and natural, and the other is illegitimate and artificial. Where do we? We're uh, we're persuaded by anarcho-capitalism here a little bit. And we get a lot of people just kind of freak out about that because we yep, have to have eyes bleed. Yeah, yeah, eyes and ears bleed mm-hmm. sometimes because they feel, I don't know, what is this thing where we have to be, we feel that we have to have this, I don't know, authority. We have to have rulers. Otherwise, we'd live in this state of pure chaos. And I mean, I think what we're living in now is pure chaos, but. Why do, why do we have to have this? Why do we feel this way? Is it just indoctrination over the last 200 years? Because obviously we had a revolution where, you know, the, the, the thought, at least in the beginning, was to be live as free people. Yeah, well, I've, I came to the, the anarcho-capitalism thing about 35 years ago, Josh. <laughs> and there was no such thing at the time, yeah. really. And I still freak out about it when I think about it. Okay, so don't don't feel bad, don't feel intimidated, uh, because it's so unusual, because it's a reflection of a totally different type of society. And you're absolutely right about this feeling that human beings have. Um, and what has essentially happened is that human beings need leaders. Uh, they want leaders. There's a natural division of labor in society between leaders and followers, in a cooperative sense. And what our rulers have done is they've taken that innate, innate sense uh, that human beings have, and they, instead of leaders and followers, they're imposing rulers, uh, sometimes democratically elected rulers. Um, and so they've substituted within that psychological framework. And, you know, basically, you know, Families need leaders. They need parents or grandparents. Um, uh, companies need leaders, which are the entrepreneurs. Um, uh, religious groups need leaders, uh, who are the priests or the you know whoever it is. Um, and so, as social beings, um, it's just natural that um, we need the law that we discussed beforehand, but in the actual conducting of, you know, not just the the cohesion of society, but the conducting of actual pursuits, we need these leaders. Uh, what we don't need is rulers. We don't <coughs> somebody imposing their will on us. And so that's a that's a different thing, and it's something that the rulers have co-opted um, to their own benefit. And, uh, and unfortunately, most of us go along with that. It, seem, it seems like it's much harder um, to persuade people that are in a democratic, basically where everybody's involved in government. And is that, is that because of the ability to manipulate each other? Everybody gets a chance to play God. And then you have the other side. They have the ability to steal. I think... I don't. I argue sometimes that it's not so much we're afraid to not have these leaders is we're not willing to give up what we have, which is to steal from each other and use force on each other. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, democracy is probably the strongest form of of government uh, in the sense that you know, in kings, uh, you know, they had to play it. Uh, they had to play the game in a much more careful sense because <laughs> they could always be overthrown by the lords of the manor or the general population. Um, and so they tended to be um, imposed much less uh, of their rule on the people. But in a democracy, everybody gets to participate, that is to vote, 
and anybody potentially could become one of these rulers. And so it's kind of like uh, a casino. You know, you've got your bet, and who knows, you may end up with a jackpot. You may be put in a position of leadership. And so it sort of says, well, you get to participate, you could be the ruler, and so therefore you should be willing to go along with this whole entire system. Um, and so in that sense, democracy is the strongest form of government because it, and it also, it tends to uh, spend its money, uh, you know, the money that it takes from its subjects, it tends to spread that money around. And so there are a lot of, there are a lot more beneficiaries in a democracy than there is in a kingdom. In a kingdom, it's just the king and the princes and the princesses and the, and the court uh, in the direct employees, the servants of the king that benefit, and very few other people do. But in a democracy, you know, they, they pass laws that, um, you know, provide unemployment benefits and welfare benefits. Uh, they provide roads and schools and all sorts of things um, that the market would otherwise provide. Uh, but it looks like the government is giving away all this stuff for free. So it looks like it's, you know, it has the appearance of being Santa Claus 365 days out of the year. <laughs> so in that sense, a, d a democracy is the hardest um, is the hardest form of form of government to undermine and to bring back to a truly free society. Uh, you know, you can undermine a democracy. Uh, like they're doing in the, the Ukraine right now as we speak. But you know darn well that as soon as the, the uh, bad guys go out, there's going to be a new set of good guys come in. Now, of course, they'll be doing much the same as the bad guys, uh, and eventually they'll have to be thrown out, whether it's democratically or in an uprising that's going on right now. I've thought about... Um you know the the way that America has gone so downhill so fast, especially in the last maybe ten or fifteen years, and I've often wondered. My brother and I have talked about it a lot. Just how is it that people haven't stood up in the last? You know, we had Jefferson saying we need to have one of these revolutions about every ten or twenty years, and yeah, we haven't even had anything close. Not that we're calling for an armed revolution or whatever, but and I think. My conclusion is that uh, it's all from voting because, like right now, you know, Mark, we're going to change things in 2016. <laughs> yeah. Next time we'll get the right person in office, Josh. Yeah, I, I think that they, I, I think that they're, you know, they use their bag of tricks very effectively. Um, the establishment has been at this for a very long time, and so yeah, I mean, a black president, you know that gives everybody, you know, some optimism that things will be better. And then Hillary comes in and you've got a woman president and, you know, so things are supposed to be better or whatever. Um, yeah, so they've been able to, to hold on. Uh, but there's clearly, you know, the number of people who are more or less totally dissatisfied with the American government has risen significantly um, over time, and in particular since this housing bubble and the government's inability to fix it, uh, I think that the the number of people that are on our side um, is you know is significant. And you know, there's been these polls out rating Congress, and uh, Congress now ranks below root canals and cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in general, the people are coming to our outlook, but what needs to happen is we've got to get them uh, so that they see. They don't have to completely understand it. They don't have to know all the details of it, but they have to be exposed to the science of liberty, and that's really Austrian economics <laughs> and libertarian theory. Um, they have to see that the free society can work and can function. Um, they have to see examples of free markets at work. They have to realize that all of the good things that they're experiencing 
uh, right now, whether it's the big flat screen TV or the smartphone or internet radio where, you know, somebody in uh, Miami, Florida could be listening to this program right now, um, when in the past that radio signal couldn't get out of the valley. Yep. And so but that's all private sector free enterprise stuff. The bad stuff, you know, the housing bubble, uh, the problem of public schools, uh, you know, the health care mess that is basically the result of government uh, taking over the health care system for many, many years. It's not Obamacare that caused the problem. It's everything that came before that. And so everywhere you find our most significant problems is where you see the most significant government involvement. We're having all these foreign policy problems in the Middle East and Afghanistan and elsewhere because of our foreign policy and our military actions in places around the globe. So we have to get out there with the science of Austrian economics and libertarian political theory, and we have to show these people. And again, they don't have to become Austrian economists or libertarian philosophers. They just have to see that it's possible and that it's going to be so much better when we all drink the Kool-Aid <laughs> and embrace our individuality. Yeah, it's, it's mind-blowing that uh, the whole idea is to live your life and let somebody else live theirs, and people can't wrap their mind around that. No, they can't. Yeah, it's pretty. It's frustrating, is what it is. I mean, I guess when Delaboete, when he uh, wrote his thesis, um, whatever you'd want to call it, did, he I mean he goes on and on. I've read that thing over and over, and where, the part where he's talking about what is it that this free thing called liberty, people just choose not to have it. It boggles my mind because I I like it. I think it's pretty cool, and I would like more of it and less domineering from the state. And yet, you go talk to your average person, and like, ah, well, you're a fool. What would you? Where would the roads come from? <laughs> yeah, and, and on and on. I mean, it's just it boggles my mind. Why can't people be free? I guess it goes back to what we were talking about, where people think they need a leader, mm -hmm. and you know, there's nothing wrong with the the actual a person voting for something, like voting in your chess club or whatever. But what is it? I don't know. I'm frustrated. Uh, isn't part of it, though, the issue that, at the bottom line, people don't want to take responsibility for their own actions? I, I mean, it seems to me that with that liberty comes responsibility. And if it's not your fault, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm just following orders. The, it, the, government, the government passed the law. <laughs> I, I just I just have to do what the what the what the government tells me. It's it's what my leader told me to do. I just have to. I'm I'm just following orders. It, another thought, real quick, if I could. It, it doesn't know, some of it have to do with the size of things. I thought about that some because people think about their neighbor, uh, all the people that they know that they interact with on a daily basis. And if you know when they're talking about, well, if we didn't have government, everything would fall apart. Everybody go crazy. And I've asked quite a few people. Who do you know that you know would be like that? And they can't answer that question. But it's always some unknown people in some unknown place that are going to freak out and be roving bands of <laughs> foaming mouth freak shows. But it's nobody that they know. If you if you make them say, who do you know? Would you be like that? Does the guy you would go to church with or the guy you work with or you interact with, is he going to be like, well, no, but there's going to be these roving bands of crazies, and if government's not here, this and this is going to happen. I mean, I do see roving bands of crazies, but they're all wearing uniforms. Oh, snap! <laughs> <laughs> now, I think that the Internet's probably the biggest push towards liberty. They're going to have to shut that down eventually. I mean, you see on things like Facebook, every day, people are tired of police atrocities. People are tired of being lorded over in a sense, but I think they're scared to not be because of these unknown people that they can't name. Yeah, well, freedom is a uh, can be a scary thing. And it's part of the great benefits of freedom uh, that, yeah, you do have to take into... Uh, you're, you have to take into account responsibility. Um, there is more uncertainty uh, when you're given uh, the latitude, when you accept 
your liberty and your responsibility, and that's one of the, the great things about it. It's uh, there's kind of a little mini rush every day that you get um, be by being responsible and successful, overcoming adversity. You know, it's kind of like if you were to climb a mountain or to go um, scuba diving uh, or jump off a cliff. You know, it's the, the, the risk is obvious there, and uh, the uncertainty is obvious there. The accomplishment is likewise very obvious. You come to the surface, you come, you know, you get to the top of the mountain, or you, you're successful in killing a deer, or whatever it happens to be. And the free life, uh, liberty and freedom is the same way, just on a lower level, that every day is uh, a little bit of a rush. Every uh, day, everything we're successful that we attempt, even if we fail sometimes, um, it just means that much more, I think, to the human spirit um, than, you know, going to a government school and, you know, <laughs> making your way through the day. Well, how many and, people do you know that just live for the weekend? They've gotten so used to this idea that their job has to suck, that, that they have to go to this workplace that is just draining the life out of them, and their human spirit is crushed against the rocks of other people that are sitting in their own you know, cubicles minding their own business, or maybe minding your business, looking over and seeing you know, what, what website are you looking at today. And, and people are just crushed by this, this mind-sucking, creativity-sucking workplace, and they don't experience that liberty on a day-to-day -day basis. How can you expect them to, to, to look for something that they've never experienced, Mark? Yeah, that's a great point, Steve. I think that that's something that I observe myself where, uh, you know, particularly people who work for the government itself. I oh, think you said that yeah. Enough. <laughs> uh, you like know, they the lose, DMV? They, yeah, they lose all uh, striving. They lose all enthusiasm. Uh, and their life boils down to, uh, you know, the next football game or whatever. And, and, and you know, I think that that, um, that spirit, you know, I, I like sports. I watch sports. You know, I'm not putting sports down entirely. It's just that the massive em influence um, uh, that, it, that it holds today, I think, is a, a symptom of the type of society that we've evolved into. Uh, where we lose that spirit, that, that early American spirit, going to the new world, you know, building a new life, transforming um, the, uh, the land into productive purposes, raising families, uh, moving west. I mean, all of that, uh, you know, the new immigrants into this country, they experience that rush. And that's why... You know, we see the, the early Americans uh, doing so well, uh, building a doctrine of freedom and individuality, uh, the immigrants that have come to this country, uh, that those, those immigrants in the first generation that follows them are some of our most successful people because they found freedom here. Uh, it was somewhat of a burden on them, I think, and they had something to prove. And you can just see in the stories and the books and the interviews um, and some of the studies that have been done, you know, it's really the newfound freedom that allowed these lives to be transformed for them to be so productive building a company, building a, a neighborhood, building a family, um, you know, and I think if we get back to real freedom, I think that everyone is going to experience a life that's more like that, maybe not as intense, but more like that, and a life that is um, where you feel less trapped into a pattern, and you're, you're more attuned to opportunities and to possibilities that actually do exist around you, but that you're too close-minded right now to take advantage of. I, I think I see um, one of the reasons people um, 
adhere to this idea of government because they do get their uh, sense of insecurity and things like that from it. I mean, the most insecure uh, moments in my life is when red and, red and blue lights come on behind me. That gets <laughs> that peps my life right up. <laughs> I'm starting to see what you're talking about. <laughs> do you <Yeah>. think? <clears throat> sorry. Do Do you think? I don't want to pick on Americans necessarily, but oh, we only got a minute. <laughs> We're getting close to the top of the hour, Josh. Well, I'll just go real quick. Do you think that Americans have that in their have liberty in their gut anymore? I mean, I know we did. I like to think about the 11 years where Americans lived free from the Declaration of Independence up until the point of the Constitution. Do we do we still have that in us? Do most Americans, do any Americans, do we have a chance here? Should we move to Chile where people are freer? <laughs> Is there well, hope I think, for America? Yeah, I think, there, I think it's still in our belly. I think that's, that's always the case. I think you can lose a lot of that. Uh, as the people of the Soviet Union did. Uh, They didn't do very well, but the next generation after them did much better. And I think that if we were to be freed, that some of us would not fare so well because of our lack of security um, emotionally. But I think a lot of people still have it in the belly and that if freedom is restored, then people are going to live free. Right on. Mark, Can you? are you going to be able to stay with us for the next hour or do you need to roll? I need to roll, but I'd be really happy to come back on the show sometime. Great. Thank you very much. Mark Thornton from the Mises Institute. Check him out on Mises.org or on Lou Rockwell. He posts on there also. And our website? PatriotsLament.blogspot.com. See you in the next hour after the Fox News. Don't touch that dial.